Does God exist? Does God not exist? You've probably heard this argument in some form, maybe as it's played out across the bestsellers list or on the web or between your family members at Thanksgiving. Heard of it, sick of it. But if I told you that I had tickets to a debate on this where the panelists were a group of angels against a group of devils, then would you want to go? Did you ever want to hear an angel's opinion on the value of hieroglyphics or the metaphysics of marriage? Or how would you like to hear an angel's definition of love? If our sources are good, we've got all that and more. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg and Life. This is the show where we take the recorded spiritual experiences of Emanuel Swedenborg, we take life, and we see where the two intersect. In this show, we're going to be spending some time off, off, way out, I don't know, left field, past left field, in the spiritual world. Um, but I think you're going to see that even as we're there, things like the electromagnetic spectrum, like volume and uh, area geometry are going to come up. So we're going to see where does Swedenborg, where do life connect. My name is Curtis Childs. I'm with the Swedenborg Foundation, who's putting this whole show on, because who else would spend this much time talking about an obscure uh, mystic from the mid-1700s? And you can be part of a conversation that prestigious if you want to. Get your questions in while the show tapes, and we'll be answering them at the end, or at least commenting on them to the best of our abilities. All right, so angels, Swedenborg says... He came out, says, I can see angels, I can talk to them. Not only that, I can record what they're saying, I can write it down and tell you about it. So a lot of people, when he was first writing these books, what what are they like? What do they talk about? So we thought we would give you that information. We're going to follow through exactly what the show promised, three conversations with angels to see what's a conversation with an angel like. All right, we're going to begin with the form of feelings. This first conversation, we actually already took you down a little bit of. We did a show not so long ago. I mean, it was a few months ago. This is why we're back on the angels theme. But it was called The Different Kinds of Angels. Now, this was an overall map of the categories of angelic functions that Swedenborg describes. And as a part of that, there was a conversation between these two guys, uh, who were from different parts of heaven, but yet we're coming together to discuss. So let's catch everyone up to speed. We'll play you that clip. This is from Swedenborg's True Christianity 386. One morning after I woke up, I saw two angels coming down from heaven. One was coming from the southern part of heaven and the other from the eastern part. They were both in carriages drawn by white horses. The carriage that was carrying the angel from the southern part of heaven was shining like silver. The carriage that was carrying the angel from the eastern part of heaven was shining like gold. The reins the angels were holding in their hands were flashing with a fiery light like the rising sun. That is how the two angels looked from far away. When they came closer, however, they no longer looked as though they were in carriages. They were simply in their own angelic form, which is human. The one who came from the eastern part of heaven was wearing shining clothes that were deep red. The one who came from the southern part of heaven was wearing clothes that were sky blue. When they reached the lower regions below the heavens, they ran toward one another as if each were trying to be the first to reach the other. They hugged and kissed each other. I heard that when these two angels lived in the world, they formed a bond of deep friendship. Yet now one was in the eastern part of heaven, and the other was in the southern part. The eastern heaven holds angels who focus on love from the Lord. The southern heaven holds angels who focus on wisdom from the Lord. After the angels spent a while talking about the magnificent things in their heavens, a question came up in their conversation about whether the essence of heaven is love or wisdom. They agreed right away that each one relates to the other, but they were discussing which one was the origin of the other. 
And that's where we left you. Because for, for that episode, we were talking about, okay, this one's from the east, this one's from the south or whatever. That's, that's, there's different kinds of angels from each. That's what matters. But we never told you, what did they say about the origin of love and wisdom? Wouldn't you want to hear what an angel had to say? So apologize for that previously. We're going to give you the rest of that conversation here. So it continues in True Christianity 386. Remember, you can click on these books, download them for free, courtesy of the Swedenborg Foundation. The angel from the heaven of wisdom asked the other angel, what is love? Sorry, what is love? The other angel replied, the love that originates from the Lord as a son is the vital heat that angels and people have. It is the underlying reality of their lives. The derivatives of love are called feelings. Feelings produce perceptions and therefore thoughts. It flows from this that wisdom starts out as love, and therefore thought starts out as the feelings related to that love. Looking at the derivatives in sequence makes it possible to see that thought is nothing but the form of the feeling. This is not generally known, because thoughts exist in light, but feelings exist in heat. And therefore, people reflect on their thoughts, but not on their feelings. Thoughts exist in light, feelings exist in heat. That's interesting, relatively Swedenborgian language, but they're actually, it's a strange concept. So our feelings are in heat, but our thoughts are in light. However, there's something in the physical world that may actually explain that phenomenon that Swedenborg describes. And we touched on it again in a previous episode. This was called Spiritual Light. And in there, we had a conversation about the electromagnetic spectrum and how it might shed some light on this. So here's what we said. One of the most interesting things about electromagnetic radiation, you know, we usually call call uh, the whole everything light, but really light is just what we perceive with our eye, which is a limited region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we are able to see light, you know, from between that has a wavelength between about 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers. And, and really light or electromagnetic radiation you know, spans a much broader range of wavelengths and energies than that. Our perception of light all happens with our eyes, but when we feel the sun's warmth or heat, what we're feeling is uh, infrared electromagnetic radiation being absorbed by our skin. So light and heat are the same thing. They're electromagnetic radiation, but we just can, certain parts of that we can feel with the sensors associated with vision. Other parts we feel with our temperature sensors. So Swedenborg is saying that, that thoughts and feelings, that thoughts are actually just a form of feelings and that thoughts are in light and feelings are in heat. Well, that's how light and warmth are, which Swedenborg says are the physical analogs of that. All right, so let's take a look at a little chart, if that doesn't make any sense. The sun is like an analog for God. Out of God comes love and wisdom, or light, spiritual light and heat. You see inside of us there, you have love, the red part, which is activated in our feelings. And then as that travels up into thoughts, it takes on a different form. It's, it's the same substance, but it's arranged differently, and now it's catching the light from God. So it has this different sense. So there's a, a mixing metaphors there, a little bit of uh, the, the spiritual and, and physical worlds, but the point is it's the same substance, but it's arranged differently, so then it can catch the different parts of God. So there's this unity within it. That's what these two angels are talking about. So they quickly mention concepts that take a little explaining, but it's probably, you know, you get up to be an angel, you talk about smart stuff, right? So let's look back at that conversation, see where it goes from there, True Christianity 386. The other angel continued, the fact that thought is nothing but the form of a feeling related to some love can be illustrated by the fact that speech is nothing but the form of sound. In fact, sound corresponds to feeling, and speech corresponds to thought. Feelings make sounds, and thoughts speak. Well, and that's even easier to see in the physical world, because we know that feelings come out in the sound of speech, and thoughts come out in the words, and we can prove it to you by playing a little game. Guess that same words, different sounds. Starring uh, there's a Chelsea from Swedenborg Foundation. I know that Matt was... Who, who produces some of this show, was agonizing over, like, is that too stupid? Should we have that in this show or not? And as is the case with this show, whenever something seems like, that's probably dumb, we shouldn't put it in, we put it in anyway. So what we're going to do here is play a game where we're going to hear the same words read, but with different emotion. And I'm going to try to guess 
what those words are. So the first one, I already know, we'll use it as a proxy, but then the next few, I didn't, I'll tell you the story when we get to them. So here's how the game works. First, let's hear a phrase. What are you doing? That sounds like, mm, I would say anger. That's right. Okay. So I didn't know we were even going to play this game until today. We were running through the show before and they had like made this without me. So I saw that one in rehearsal, but these next three, I actually don't know what feeling it's supposed to be. So I'm going to guess and we're going to see what happens. All right. Uh, <laughs> somehow this all proves something. Okay. Here's the next one. What are you doing? Okay. That's like, oh man, is it disgust or is it annoyance? I'm going to go disgust. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there are people who are going, this is all rigged. There's no way he's that smart. Okay. Let's listen to the next one. What are you doing? Mm, that's friendly, but I, maybe it's curious. Let's see. Curious. Ah, it's funny. The happy. Okay. Last one. I, I, hopefully I can do better than break even here. Let's see. What's our last sound? What are you doing? Is it sleepy? <laughs> Is it sad? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go with um, uh, I'm gonna go with sad. Yeah. Okay. So th that proves something. It proves that no. It proves that there's something being communicated beyond the words. The all four of those had no. Uh, change in the intellectual part, in the thought part. It was completely changed the feeling or the sound. So we know it was just the, the, the tone of it changed. I got different messages out of it. And so that shows that, yes, sound is the communicator for feeling while words are the communicator for speech. So turns out angels were right. TC386, let's see what else they have to say. And the other angels continued, this point would become crystal clear if someone were to say, take the sound out of your speech. Would there be any speech left? Also, take the feeling out of your thinking. Would there be any thinking left? Clearly, then, the most important ingredient in wisdom is love. So, you can't have one without the other. Yeah, the, all of those had to be some emotion. Even if you said it flat, it would be, you know, monotone, bored. There, there's got to be some sound to the whole thing in order to make it go. And uh, there, so, so there's this dynamic between sound and speech, and that's echoed across a bunch of different things. We have a little chart here. Uh, so sound is to speech what feeling is to thinking, according to these angels, what they told Swedenborg. He also, they also go on to say that that's the same dynamic that exists between goodwill and faith. Hey, wait, can we go back to that uh, chart for a second? But the same dynamic that exists between goodwill and faith, because faith or external religious kind of stuff should only be an outer effect of goodwill or love toward people, right? It also says the same thing happens with love and wisdom. That wisdom is the outward manifestation of love. So that duality comes out a ton in Swedenborg. All right, let's continue our conversation back to TC 386. The angels express, oh, and this is kind of a note, because you may have like shown up here saying, hey, conversation with angels, this can be so cool, and then they start talking, and you're like, that sounds like normal, I don't, is that really that cool? This is Swedenborg's disclaimer. The angels express these thoughts in a spiritual way. Spiritual speech includes thousands of nuances that earthly language cannot express. In fact, surprising to say, these nuances are not, those nuances are not even thinkable with the idea of earthly thought. So, and he actually, he tells this same story in Apocalypse Revealed, which is another book of his, so I'm going to take his, his disclaimer from there, because I like even better how he phrases it. This is AR-875. He's, again, talking about how these angels were, were talking to each other. The angels spoke about this spiritually, and spiritual speech embraces thousands of things that natural speech is incapable of expressing. Right. And what is surprising, they cannot even fall within the scope of ideas of natural thought. But here's where he says, please remember what has been said here. And when you go from natural light into spiritual light, which happens after death, inquire then what faith and charity are, and you will clearly see that faith is charity in form, and thus that charity is everything in faith, consequently that it is the soul, life, and essence of faith, altogether as affection is of thought and as sound is of speech. Moreover, if you wish, you will see that the formation of faith from charity is like the formation of speech from sound, because the two correspond. Essentially, 
It's going to sound uh, here, but if you start to be able to think spiritually like we do when we pass on to the next life, this is all going to seem really cool. So even despite that, we're going to soldier on here with our show, trying to communicate these spiritual concepts in an earthly way. So after those angels had made those points about love and wisdom, faith and charity, which originated which, it was time for them to go, but Swedenborg said as they were leaving, little stars appeared around their heads, and that this was a symbol of the knowledge that they had gained, and that in the spiritual world, things like that occur spontaneously when you've made internal changes, external changes happen. He also said as they were leaving, it seemed like they were again in their chariots from the beginning, Uh, and that was an appearance, and actually later in the show, there's a very specific spelling out of this is why people appear like they have chariots from afar, so I won't go into it now. Anyway, that was seeming to be the end of the conversation, but it's not the end of the story, as Swedenborg put it, and actually the the thoughts those two angels had weren't quite completed yet, and we're going to see how that all comes together in what happened next. After those two angels passed out of my sight, I noticed a garden to my right. It had olive trees, fig trees, laurels, and palm trees planted in an arrangement based on their correspondences. I looked into the garden and saw angels and spirits walking and talking among the trees. Just then an angelic spirit looked back at me. Angelic spirits is the term for people in the world of spirits who are being prepared for heaven. The angelic spirit left the garden, walked up to me and said, Do you want to come with me into our paradise? You will see and hear amazing things. I went along. The angelic spirit said to me, The people you see here, and there were many of them, all have a love for truth and have the light of wisdom as a result. There is a magnificent building here that we call the Temple of Wisdom. Yet people are unable to see it if they believe they have a significant amount of wisdom. They are even less able to see it if they believe they have a sufficient amount of wisdom. And they are the least able to see it if they believe their wisdom originates in themselves. The reason is that people like this lack the love for real wisdom that would make them receptive to the light of heaven. Real wisdom consists in our seeing, in the light of heaven, that what we know, understand and have wisdom about is like a drop compared to the ocean of what we do not know, do not understand and are not wise about. It is hardly anything at all. All the people in this garden paradise who acknowledge on the basis of inner perception and vision, that they have relatively little wisdom, can see the temple of wisdom. The human mind's inner light lets people see it, but the mind's outer light, without any inner light, does not. I had often thought this about myself. At first, through book learning, and later through my own perception of it, and finally, because I saw it in an inner light, I had come to acknowledge that we have very little wisdom. Therefore, I was granted ability to see the temple. So you can only see it if you have a humility within you. That's the only thing that opens your mind to seeing this building. And actually, that is a common theme in the heaven experience, that actually, if you're not prepared for heaven, you don't have the mindset, which includes humility, and you're taken up into heaven, you don't see anything. People say, there's nothing around here, because you've got to have your your spiritual eyes open enough to be able to see it. So Swedenborg did, and he was able to write it down. So what was that temple like? We're, We're into TC 387 now. It had an amazing form. It stood extremely high above the earth, square, walls made of crystal, a roof made of translucent jasper elegantly arched, a foundation made of different types of precious stone. There were steps of polished alabaster so that people could go up into the temple. At the sides of the steps, there were images of lions with their cubs. Then I asked whether it was all right to go in. I was told it was all right, so I went up the stairs. As I went in, I saw something like angel guardians flying near the ceiling, but they soon disappeared. The floor I was walking on was made of cedar. With its translucent roof and walls, the whole temple was built to be a form of light. The angelic spirit came in with me. I mentioned what I had heard from the two angels about love and wisdom and goodwill and faith. The angelic spirit did they also said, did they not also mention a third element? What third element, I asked. What's it going to be? 
There's a third thing. It's not all just about love and wisdom. And what that angel said to Swedenborg was, it's good, useful action. And actually, you have to have that. It's a container. Without that container, love and wisdom are just these smoky, sort of ethereal, conceptual things. But when they are placed and lived in through good, useful action, that's when there's this completeness. And that's when the thing becomes real and alive. So you can't just, it's not enough just to feel and think about things. You've got to do them. They can't be separated. So there, that triune, that sort of love, wisdom, use occurs, or that, that pairing of that progression of three levels occurs throughout everything. Swedenborg says it's in the divine design. It's in the nature of the universe, and we can see it all over. For example, we have uh, a, couple of, a couple of places where this shows up. Love, wisdom, usefulness. That's a very Swedenborgian one that we just talked about. That is also reflected in the philosophical purpose means result. This is actually something in any business, you're, okay, what are we trying to do? How do we get there? What did we achieve? But then you also have goodwill, faith, and good actions. Again, it's a Swedenborgian look at it, but this is, this is the role of religion or of, of spirituality should be, you have good things in your heart, you've got these principles you live by, it leads you to do good things for the world. If you're not doing any of those, if any of those are left out, it doesn't work. Then we also have within a person, a feeling leads us to want something, thought is how we can do it, and then you work, you do it out. You've, you've probably heard that before. And with another twist on inside a person, Swedenborg says, we have these three parts to us, essentially, the will and the intellect, which make up our spirit or the psychological part of us, and then the body. But this is the order it progresses in. First, something occurs in our will, moves through to the intellect, and finally is is released or made actual through the actions of the body. But beyond that, just the structure of things, you look at geometry, a line to an area to a volume, this is three dimensions, and Swedenborg says those dimensions are actually a reflection of this three-leveled nature of things, and that if you have an object that moves in just one dimension, that's like love. The second dimension is like wisdom, and you can move in two. But when you can move into a third dimension, it's like you have all three. That actually, the, if we could read it right, the way dimensions work could teach us about love, wisdom, and action, that all the universe is reflecting itself because it's all meant to be a teaching tool. Right, so that's what Swedenborg learned, and let's see what, what the response was there. True Christianity 387, the angelic spirit continued, the same principle applies to each and every created thing. All of them culminate in a third stage. So apparently we can find a third stage in not just that stuff, but everything. This is why three in the word means whole and complete. Jesus was uh, three days before he resurrected, etc. For this reason, I cannot help feeling amazed that some people claim they believe in faith alone, others in goodwill alone, and still others in good actions alone. Yet the first element is nothing without the second, and both of these are nothing without the third. Then I asked, isn't it possible for people to have goodwill and faith and yet not to have good actions? Isn't it possible for people to have a desire and a thought, yet do nothing? That could only happen in theory the angel answered. It could not happen in reality. For these things to exist even theoretically, the people would have to maintain a drive or a will to do something. Will or drive is actually a form of action, since it is a constant striving to act, which under the right circumstances becomes an external action. Therefore, all wise people take the internal actions of a drive or a will to be entirely the same as external actions, because that is how God takes them, provided the drive or will continues when an opportunity to act presents itself. There it ends. Conversation with angels. How did you like it? Not enough drama for you? You want to see some arguing? Okay, all right, we'll give you that to you in part two. In this conversation, we are going to find ourselves discussing thunderstorms. And you know we have thunderstorms here. They result from conditions in the physical world. I don't know what those are. I guess the temperature of different masses of air, atmospheric conditions, something to do with water, I bet. That makes thunderstorms. That's in the physical world. But in the spiritual world, phenomena like that arise for spiritual reasons, meaning 
psychological uh, thought type, feeling type reason. So we're going to see wh- how that happens here. We're going to actually, this is the story that Swedenborg told. I'm going to be your narrator. I will play the part of Swedenborg, and we'll have some other uh, beings stopping in to play the parts in the script. Okay, let's set the scene. Early one day, after I had emerged from sleep but was still not fully awake, I was meditating in the light of the cloudless morning, when through the window I saw something like lightning flashing and heard something like a peal of thunder. As I wondered what was going on, I heard from heaven that there were some not far from me who were aggressively debating about God and nature. The flashes of light were like lightning, and the rumble in the air like thunder were correspondences manifesting the conflict and clashing of the arguments. One side was for God, the other for nature. Nature meaning physical reductionist materialism, that there's only the physical world. The spiritual confrontation arose in the following way. Some Satans in hell had said to each other, I wish we could talk to angels from heaven. We could fully and completely demonstrate to them that what they call God, the source of all things, is actually nature. God is only a word, unless it means nature. Because the Satans believed this with all their heart and soul, because they longed to talk with angels from heaven, they were given permission to come up from the mud and darkness of hell and speak with two angels who were just then coming down from heaven. The Satans were in the world of spirits, which is midway between heaven and hell. Once they spotted the angels, the Satans hurried rapidly toward them. With voices full of rage, the Satans began shouting. Are you the angels of heaven we're allowed to meet face to face to debate God and nature? They call you wise for acknowledging God, but actually you're complete idiots. Who has seen God? Who understands what God is? Who grasps the idea that God rules and has power over the universe and everything in it? Only the lower classes would acknowledge something they don't see or understand. What's more obvious than the fact that nature is the all in all? What eye has seen anything but nature? What ear has heard anything but nature? What nose has smelled anything but nature? What tongue has tasted anything but nature? What hand or body has felt anything but nature? Our physical senses are our witnesses to truth. We swear on the testimony of our senses. Our breathing is another witness, the respiration that keeps our body alive. What do we breathe? But nature, our heads and yours are in nature. Where does the inflow into the thoughts in our heads come from, if not from nature? If nature were taken away, could you think at all? And many other arguments made out of the same ingredients. After the Satan's finished, the angels answered. You speak that way because you trust your senses alone. All the spirits in hell enmesh their thinking in their physical senses. They cannot lift their minds above their senses. So we forgive you. A life of evil and a belief in falsity have closed off the inner realms of your mind so completely that you cannot be lifted above sensory input, unless you happen to be in a state that is remote from the evils in your life and the falsities in your belief. A Satan who hears the truth can in fact understand it as well as an angel can, but the Satan does not retain it because evil erases truth and introduces falsity. We are aware though that you are in a remote state now and are able to understand the truth we're telling you. Pay attention then to what we're about to say. You used to be in the physical world. The angels continued. You left that place and now you're in the spiritual world. Before now, did you know anything about life after death? You previously denied that there was a life after death. You put yourselves on a par with animals. Did you know anything before about heaven and hell? Did you know anything about the light and heat in this world? Do you realize that you're now above the realm of nature and no longer in it? This world is spiritual and so is everything in it. Spiritual things are so far beyond physical things that not even the least bit of the nature where you used to be can flow into this world. Because you viewed nature as some god or goddess, you still view the light and heat of this world as nature's light and heat, although they do not belong to nature at all. In fact, what is light and warm in nature is dark and cold here. Did you know anything before about the sun in this world that provides our light and heat? Were you aware that this sun is pure love, while the sun in the physical world is pure fire? You realize that the sun of pure fire in the physical world was the origin and sustainer of nature. Did you realize that the sun of pure love in heaven is the origin and sustainer of life itself, which is love together with wisdom? Nature, then, which you made into a god or a goddess, is clearly dead. 
If you were granted protection, you could ascend with us into heaven. If we were granted protection, we could descend with you into hell. In heaven, you would see magnificent and dazzling things. In hell, we would see hideous and filthy things. This difference between heaven and hell exists because all who are in heaven worship God, while all who are in hell worship nature. The magnificent and dazzling things in the heavens correspond to feelings of love for good and truth. The hideous and filthy things in the hells correspond to feelings of love for evil and falsity. From all that we have said then, make up your minds now about whether God or nature is the all in all. The Satans replied to this. In our current state, from what we've heard, we're able to conclude that there is a God. But when our enjoyment of evil preoccupies our minds, we see nothing but nature. I could see and hear the two angels and the Satans because they were standing not far from me. To my surprise, around them I saw many who had been famous scholars when they were in the physical world. I was amazed to notice that at one moment the scholars would stand beside the angels, and the next moment beside the Satans. They agreed with whomever they were standing beside. I was told, The changes in place the scholars make are actually the changes of state in their mind, as they agree first with one side and then with the next. They are chameleons in their beliefs. What's more, we'll tell you a mystery. We have looked down into the world at famous scholars and have found that 600 out of 1,000 are for nature and the rest are for God. Furthermore, we found that the only reason there were even that many for God was that they often made statements based not on any comprehension, but merely on their having heard that nature comes from God. Repeated statements based on something remembered give the impression of belief even when there's no thought or understanding there. Afterwards, the Satans were granted protection and went up with the two angels into heaven. They did indeed see magnificent and dazzling things. Enlightened in the light of heaven there, they acknowledged that there is a God, that nature was created to serve the life that comes from God, and that nature of itself is dead. It activates nothing on its own. Instead, it is activated by life. When they had seen and learned these things, they went back down. As they went down, their love for evil returned. It closed off their intellect at the top and opened it up at the bottom. Above it, there appeared a dark shadow flashing with hellfire. The instant they set foot on the ground, it opened up under them, and they fell back down to their own people. I want to stress again, nature, that does not mean uh, ecosystems, animals, plants. It's not like, it, choose God or choose, you know, Henry David Thoreau, w- Walden, walk in the woods, something like that. It is, nature means only believing the physical world is all that there is. And pretty interesting that you get people, according to Swedenborg, in the spiritual world who want to say there's only the physical world. That The angels had to remind these Satans, hey, you know you used to be alive in the world, remember then you died and you found out your consciousness survived death, and they're like, oh yeah, 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 but we don't really like that, the implications of that, so we're, we're not going to take it in. And everyone's free to reject things or accept things as they want. So there was a little debate between angels and demons, and we're going to finish the show with a third conversation, and this one takes place uh, with a visit to an ancient culture. We are not the only people in the world interested in Swedenborg's material. Uh, Actually, there's other people that were interested enough that this next story we're going to read to you, they actually made it into a book for kids. So we asked if we could use their illustrations from that book, and they said yes. Now, in that book... It doesn't use Swedenborg's actual text because it's just not for kids. It's too philosophical. It's too many big words. So we're using Swedenborg's text, but with children's illustrations, in the hopes that it'll be fun. So this is the story, uh, and the book, oh yeah, the book, the title is uh, The Silver Age, because that's what we're going to visit, all right? And this this uh, this conversation comes from Swedenborg's book, conjugal love, or as a translation we're going to be using, is is translated love in marriage. Uh, the previous one I forgot to mention was from True Christianity. So let's take a look at how the trip to the Silver Age begins. The next day the same angel came to me and said, 
Do you want me to guide and accompany you to the people who lived in the Silver Age or era to hear from them about the marriages of their time? And he said that they cannot be approached either except by the Lord's authority. It was a spiritual experience as before, and my guide accompanied me. First, we came to a hill where east and south meet, and while we were on its slope, he showed me a great expanse of land spread out, and we saw a mountain rising in the distance. Between it and the hill where we stood was a valley, and beyond the valley a plain and a slope gently rising from it. We went down the hill to cross the valley, and here and there to the sides we saw wood and stone carved in the form of people and different animals, birds and fish. I asked the angel, what are they? Are they idols? Are they idols? Swedenborg, you know, coming from a Christian tradition, goes, visits with this angel, this community of peop of ancient people who are supposed to be really with it. You know, these people had really good spirituality. Are these, are they worshiping images? What are all those images? And what did his angel guide say? We're going to turn now to love and marriage number 76. Um, he said, absolutely not. They are forms to represent different moral virtues and spiritual truths. The people of that age knew about correspondences. And because every man, animal, bird, and fish corresponds to some quality, each sculpture represents an aspect of some virtue or truth. And a group of several represents the general extended form of the virtue or truth. These are what were called hieroglyphics in Egypt. So what's cool about Swedenborg is that he doesn't just say, here's the, here's the spiritual truth, everything outside it, it doesn't mean anything. Or here's one set of traditions that, that sort of kept the truth. It's very uh, expansive, it's very inclusive. He's saying that hieroglyphics in ancient Egypt, far removed from the traditions that he was uh, in himself, he says those actually came out of correspondences or this innate knowledge uh, from this ancient religion of the meaning of these symbols that the physical world produces. So hieroglyphics were this representation of heavenly things. That's where our sort of, hu the human race's early pictorial uh, systems of writing came from. And he, actually, Swedenborg made an offer to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He wrote them a letter, and we're going to read a little part of it here. Uh, he says, Inasmuch as this science of correspondences was the science of sciences among the ancients, whence their wisdom was derived, it is of importance that someone of your academy should devote labor to this science, which may be done especially from the correspondences disclosed in the Apocalypse revealed, and there demonstrated from the Word. If it should be so desired, I am willing to explain the Egyptian hieroglyphics, which are nothing else than correspondences, and to publish the explanation more that can be more uh, as it can be done by anyone else. I can't read that last word. As this can, this can be done uh, by anything else. Emmanuel Swedenborg. <laughs> um, two things are funny. One is I couldn't read that last sentence, but another thing that's funny is that he was saying, these should really, you guys should really know what hieroglyphics mean. You should get someone to do it. I'm the only one who can really do it, so let me, let me take a crack at it. I find that fascinating. That actual project never happened, so for, for various reasons it didn't get off the ground. But he was offering to, to take a detour from what he was writing and, and explain hieroglyphics. Because you'll find Swedenborg explaining text in the Bible, and you think, is he only Christian-focused? But he would have gladly explained those hieroglyphics if the opportunity presented itself. That didn't stop people, Swedenborg scholars, after his death from trying to figure out, can you piece together from what Swedenborg wrote, uh, what these hieroglyphics are? So this was Carl Odner wrote a book called Correspondences of Egypt. This book is actually now, I believe, out of print, so you're very lucky to get a peek at it from us here. And he was just uh, talking a little bit about the Ankh, uh, which uh, you may have seen, it. there's a couple different forms of it here, and he, he gives a little speculation on its imagery and what role correspondences play. So this is a quote from that book, The Correspondences of Egypt. While all Egyptologists admit that they do not know the origin of the Ankh symbol or what natural object it represents, they unanimously declare that it signifies life, and especially life after death, eternal life. To a new churchman, 
That's uh, one word for followers of Swedenborg, because Swedenborg talks about this new church that's going to come to the earth. This interesting symbol suggests many things. Most obviously, the crown of eternal life, which is won by the cross of temptation, suffering, and death, and was known to the ancient church throughout the world long before the crucifixion of the Lord made it the most sacred emblem of the Christian faith. It is very, its very form suggests at once the idea of the self-will of man, the downward stroke, being broken by the level stroke of rational truth, the experience, when successful, resulting in the circle of eternal happiness. So you can, by taking some building blocks of the symbolism Swedenborg discusses, try to look at these hieroglyphics. What could they mean, or where do they derive their meaning from? For what it's worth, we did an episode a long time ago called What God Looks Like, and in that we talked about how Swedenborg had an experience where through the right eye he could see God as a sun, and through the left eye he could see God as a moon. And in that episode we compared it to a near-death, a modern near-death experience where somebody had that very same thing happen to them. There's also an Egyptian god named Horus who was pictured as a falcon. His right eye was often associated with the sun, left eye associated with the moon. And there's this whole story about the eye being taken and restored and how that that could relate to faith separated from charity, which Swedenborg talks about. We're not going to get into that now. This is a whole huge tangent we're going on. It's just to show that don't take one spiritual tradition like Swedenborg's and, amount, and think, because this is right, everything else is, is irrelevant. There's truth seeping through in all kinds of traditions all over the place. So let's return to our story at hand. This is what happened next. We pushed on through the valley, and when we reached the plain, we saw horses and chariots. The horses were equipped and harnessed in various ways, and the chariots had different forms, some carved like eagles, others like whales, others like stags with horns, others like unicorns. And finally we saw some wagons and stables around to the side. But when we came closer, the horses and the chariots disappeared, and instead of them we saw people walking along two by two, talking and discussing things. The angel told me, what looked like horses, chariots, and stables from a distance are images of the rational wisdom of the people from that era. Because of their correspondence, a horse stands for understanding truth, a chariot stands for truth's principles, and stables stand for teachings. You know that everything in this world looks like what it corresponds to. I told you, didn't I say at the beginning, I made a, pro a solemn promise to you that we would talk about why people appear like they're in chariots from afar. My question to you is, has it changed? Would it be automobiles now or some kind of trans comparable transportation, bicycles, something like that? Uh, Swedenborg says that the stuff we see in this world is a manifestation of the spiritual world and that the stuff in his time that he was seeing in the spiritual world, a lot of it lined up with the technology of his day. What's there now? I don't know. But we're, don't don't always think that everything in the spiritual world is is from a few centuries ago. But this is how at least it was at the time. All right, returning to the story, Love and Marriage 76. But we passed by them, these are the, the people in the chariots they saw, and went up a long slope and finally saw a city, which we entered. Walking through it, we observed its houses from the avenues and squares. They were all palaces made of marble. There were alabaster steps in front of them and columns of jasper beside these steps. We also saw temples of precious stone, the color of sapphire and lapis lazuli. The angel said to me, Their houses are stone because stones stand for worldly truths, and precious stones stand for spiritual truths. Everyone who lived in the Silver Age acquired his intelligence from spiritual truths, and in this way from worldly truths. Silver stands for the same thing. And I should pause here for a second to talk about what is this? What is the Silver Age? We did a show once that was called The Spiritual History of the Human Race. You can check it out. Swedenborg describes five major phases of human spirituality. You had the first, which could be called the Golden Age. This is the second one. This was after the first one had gone downhill. Corruption had set in. The human mind was sort of reconfigured and, and reset, and you had this new group of people who became very good people, but in a different way. That's the Silver Age. They're going to meet people in the spiritual world who lived in that era. So that's what they are, and they're actually there 
to investigate marriage in that era, because this book Swedenborg wrote, uh, here's translated, Love and Marriage, so they're trying to learn about the nature of it. So they were walking along, they saw couples, and they were there to learn about them. One couple invited them in, and they said this, "'We were among the people in Asia,' they answered. Swedenborg and the angel had asked them about marriages in, in their era. And the concerns of our era was a study of truths, which gave us intelligence. This concern was the endeavor of our mind and soul, but the concern of our bodily senses was representations of truths in forms. Knowledge of correspondences joined the sensory aspects of our bodies with the perceptive aspects of our minds and gave us intelligence." So what that same study of symbolism led them to learn things about marriage. So we have a diagram here. What they said is there's a marriage of good and truth, and that marriage of good and truth in in everything, and we talked about it earlier in the show, that marriage corresponds to the marriage of a husband and a wife. The, the, The husband and wife being joined like that was an image of love and wisdom being joined, sort of a a manifestation of that. And for what it's worth, there's actually a marriage inside each person as well, because we all have love and wisdom within us. If you want to go even further into trivia, Swedenborg says that in women, that marriage is love with wisdom inside it, and in men, it's wisdom with love inside it. Now, that is, uh, there's, there's a lot more you can see about that, and I'll reference it at the end. But just like in a marriage, if good and truth are separated, if they go, if you break it up and you're looking at a different good or a different truth, that destroys the marriage. You have, it has to be, each good has to be with its own truth, and there has to be a faithfulness in there, just like there needs to be a faithfulness in marriages for them to work and stay together. So uh, there's a lot more on that. We did an episode called Spiritual Marriage, which you can check out if you would like to, uh, and then you can learn. He, you know, also this book we're reading now, Love and Marriage, was all about that whole thing. Anyway, there was a little more that was said uh, by, by these angels about it. So let's take a look back at Love and Marriage. The husband led us to an outer room, and this is starting to look at the furniture because remember, everything there is a is a outer symbol for inner things. The husband led us to an outer room where there were many works of art on the walls and small sculptures that seemed to be cast in silver. I asked what they were. The couple said they are pictures and sculptures representing the many qualities, attributes, and delights having to do with the love in marriage. These represent unity of soul, so he's pointing to things at the wall, these joining of minds, and these the concord in your hearts, and those the joys springing from it. So you w- wouldn't necessarily know it coming right up, but this this was sort of a, this is a de- visual depiction of the joy of that union of minds that they had in marriage. But there was one particular symbol that they stopped and took some time on, so here's a little, an image of it here. Um... Uh, So they had this rainbow on the wall, and this is what they said about it. While watching, we saw something like a rainbow on the wall composed of three colors, crimson, blue, and white. And we saw how the crimson shaded off into the blue and tinted the white with dark blue. This color flowed back through the blue into the crimson and made it shine out in a flaming brightness. The husband said to me, you do understand this? I answered, explain it to me. He said, from its correspondence, the crimson stands for a wife's married love, the white a husband's intelligence, the blue is the beginning of married love in a husband's insight from his wife, and then the dark blue that, t- that tinted the white is the married love in the husband. So they had this moving visual depiction of this thing on the wall. So then we'll continue what they said there, and this is again Love and Marriage 76. This color seeping back from the blue into the crimson and making it shine out in a flaming brightness stands for the husband's married love flowing back to the wife. Things like this are displayed on the walls while we fasten our eyes on the rainbow pictured here, thinking over the love in marriage, its mutual, ongoing, simultaneous union. To this I said, these things are more than secret today, because they're sites that represent unknown things about the married love of one man with one wife. They are, he replied, but they aren't unknown to us here, so they aren't secret. Again, you see some, there's like technical kind of metaphysics of how love flows in between two people, and Swedenborg goes into this extensively in in this book that we're reading from now. So 
let's see. So they they learned what they came to learn, and then it was time to go, and we're going to see a little clip of how that happened. When he said this, a chariot appeared in the distance drawn by white ponies. When the angel saw it, he said, that chariot is a signal to us to go. Then, as we went down the steps, our host gave us a cluster of white grapes with the vine leaves attached, and the leaves turned to silver. We brought it away as a souvenir that we had talked with the people of the Silver Age. This is an example of what you could call exit imagery. They saw a chariot, and when they saw that out the window, they knew, okay, Swedenborg and other, an angel guide, you gotta go because we can't talk to you anymore. And this happens repeatedly in these narratives of experiences that Swedenborg gives. For example, there in, in the same book, he was talking to a group of angel wives and getting from them some more of these secrets of how does marriage work. And there was a dove outside at the window sitting there, and he describes details of it. And while the dove was still there, they kept telling him things. But as soon as it flew away, they stopped. They said, okay, that's enough. We, we can't tell you anymore. Because these correspondences, if you know how to read them, they knew that means it's time to be done. And then on the flip side, he was hanging out with the husbands and hearing from them what they knew about marriage, and there was a swan. And this swan, while it was there, they all told him everything, but as soon as it left, they said, all right, man, you got to take off. We're done here. So there's these symbols that, that angels can read, and that adds to their intelligence. And everything is symbolic. The, that little branch that they got at the end of this story with silver and grapes and leaves, those are all symbolic of this silver age. It all has meaning, because that's how the spiritual world works. And that has been, hopefully, something that happened today. You got a little sense of how the spiritual world, according to Swedenborg, which hopefully is according to how it really is, works. If you feel like you did get anything good out of it, feel free to like and subscribe. That helps our channel out immensely and pushes the video out to other people who may get something good out of it. So thanks for watching, and if you want to support the Swedenborg Foundation and make programming like this possible, then hopefully you would be willing to make a little donation, which we're going to tell you about in this video here, and afterwards we'll get to your questions. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. Thanks very much for your support. We, we appreciate all the donations we have been getting. It makes the whole thing go. And now let's go look at some questions. All right, first one. Bonfils Bati. Did Swedenborg interpret other books than Genesis, Exodus, and Revelation? If not, why? He doesn't go through any other books in their entirety, and the reason why, as I understand it, is this. When Swedenborg first started his revelatory writing phases, phase, he thought he was going to go straight through the entire Bible, so he started at the beginning, and he was doing this uh, interpretation or exegesis, and, and in that... He was just going through and going through, but I think whether he got some kind of spiritual signal or whether he was just watching how it was received or whatever prompted him, he diverged from that and began writing. He wrote Heaven and Hell, which was trying to reference everyone back to Secrets of Heaven, which was going through the Bible. Uh, he would write a chapter in that and then put all these little footnotes, go see this part, and part of it maybe because nobody was picking up his biblical interpretation. Um, but then he, he there's a couple times throughout that he changed course, including in his explanation of the book of Revelation, he had written this thing called Apocalypse Explained, which was big and long and really complex. He had completely finished it, but he never published it. He, he scrapped it and went on and then published uh, Apocalypse Revealed, which is much shorter. We don't know exactly why, but so so I don't know why, why he didn't ever go through the other ones systematically. Perhaps he felt like the beginning, he started the beginning because he thought he was going to go through the whole thing and then thought Book of Revelation is really important because of the message that's in it. However, he does give all kinds of explanations of the stuff in the Bible that occurs in the interim, particularly 
the prophets, you know, uh, Psalms, uh, Isaiah, those kinds of books. He talks about them all the time, but it's just in little bits. You know, people have written uh, anthologies or collections of what he says about all those parts, um, but he doesn't go through it systematically. So those are my thoughts. It's a great question. Uh, Let's take a look at the next one. Lisa, do angels have more feelings than people on earth? Like in heaven, there are more colors. Oh, that's good. Swedenborg says there are colors in the other world that are beyond, there there are extra colors, which is, is hard to imagine what that would be like. I'm looking around this room right now thinking what colors are missing. But so if, if, if we can expand something like colors, are there different feelings? And I'd say yes, and I'd say to a huge degree, because when Swedenborg describes, he never mentions that particular spe- specificity, saying you have feelings you don't have here, sort of. I mean, he talks about experiencing heavenly peace and, and uh, the, the things in, that are celestial and spiritual being indescribable, uh, the kinds of, of, of emotion you have being just almost impossible to communicate any semblance of in our work. So I'd imagine those are different feelings. There's also, he, he talks about different kinds of relationships you have there and feelings that go with them. So I would say certainly, and he says that you can go on expanding and gaining love and wisdom, which lead to feelings, as we saw in this episode, forever. So I would think not only are there more feelings in heaven, but I think whatever, a thousand years in time, there's not really time in the same way in the spiritual world, but you, way down the road, will continue to gain, I never felt anything like this before, that with the experience of heaven is everything is like a new beginning. So you're going to feel like, I'm just finally waking up, even though you felt so alive and awake before that. That's how he describes it anyway. Cool question. Next one. Sam, you guys say that when you cross over that you don't grow, or how would you go to a different level of heaven? Or maybe you're not an angel right at first. I was listening to something earlier today, and you seem to be saying that when you first cross over, you're in the land of spirits, and that's like 30 years. I'm confused. Yeah, so the progression. What's the progression? Swedenborg does describe an initial phase. That there's growth and there's not growth. There's both. Hey, that's a good little rhyme to help you remember. There is an initial phase in what he calls the world of spirits. This is really, there's a part of it that's growth, but it's really more of a distilling, that we grow while we're in this world, and then when you get into the world of spirits, you're kind of shaken out so that the parts that are really truly you stay, and sort of the extra baggage uh, falls off. That period varies. How long that is varies depending on how authentic you are, meaning if you if you really are inside a lot like you are outside, very quickly you you see within yourself, do I want heaven or do I want hell? But if you're kind of more mixed up, it can take time to sort that out. Swedenborg at one point says, no longer than 30 years are you in the... But of course, it's relative because he says there's not actually time like that. So that's the first phase. Then once you... If you go to heaven, you do... You don't change your core love like if, what what the essence of what makes you 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 don't change but you are continually expanding that so there is it's not like you you're growing and then a thousand years you 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 love everyone but then you know a thousand years later you start to hate everyone you don't change in that way but you do become wiser and you do become fuller and and happier to eternity he says some things about that growth but it encompasses many more specifics than than I, of course, that I know about, or, or that, that probably even Swedenborg knew about. So there is growth, there's just not a transformation of, there's an expansion, there's not a reversing of the core part of, of who you are. So being confused is going to be part of the territory with Swedenborg's stuff. Uh, hopefully I've cleared it up a little for you here, or maybe I made it worse. So either way, thanks for the question. Next one, Katrina. So we still have a wisdom ego and can't see the temple of wisdom when we cross over. There is... Not everybody's perfect all the time. Um, It depends. And there's a a large variation of people. You know, you have people... Hell, the more ego that we have, the more in hell we are. And so people that are in that mindset would not be able to see the, the temple at all. Now, Swedenborg may have been in that particular experience in the world of spirits... Uh, where you have, as I just talked about, a wide variety of different levels of ego-driven versus love-driven mindsets. However, even angels, 
are, as I just said and to the previous question, are continually being perfected. So you're obviously not perfect to begin with. There, there are still issues that you can have, and Swedenborg even says that from time to time, angels, you know, we, we exist in a very happy state when we get there, but you do get led into some negative states that you still have hanging on, and you actually go through little struggles and try to overcome those. So, you know, there's, it's, not, it's, not, it's like the cycle of seasons. There's spring and summer. If you're in a warm climate, there, it's warm most of the time, but there may be a, a cold, rainy season here or there. That's kind of what you can go through. So it's not all like nobody ever struggles with anything. There's still work. It's just not as much of a grind as it is here, and you, you just make a lot more progress. So there's my thoughts on that. Next one. Bond fills body. Again, right we are here? Okay, what's the difference between intelligence, rational, memory, knowledges, and sensory? And that is something I would love to know myself. Those are different terms that Swedenborg uses, and they're translated in different ways in different books. But it seems like you're going in descending order there. That intelligence is the hot, well, I'll start at the bottom. Sensory is just what it sounds like, the, the most basic physical input, along with our sort of basest urges, like uh, sort of your animal fight or flight kind of I want what I want stuff. The Swedenborg calls that the sensory or outermost level. Memory knowledges seem to be, from what he describes, from what I understand, basic facts. You know, these are just the building blocks of knowledge. They're not moral or immoral. They're just truths about the world, and more, maybe more specifically about kind of lower things rather than spiritual truths. Rationality is the human ability to comprehend and put things together, but that, but Swedenborg says you're more rational the more love you have, like, like we showed before that wisdom and love are joined together. And intelligence is getting up into the spiritual level, uh, where where this is where you're seeing, fa- you're arranging facts in the light of truth. So this is taking these memory knowledges and arranging them in the light of, of truth and of love, that you're using all the things in your mind to paint a correct, loving picture of the world. And then one space above your list here would be wisdom, and then that's where we're all trying to get to. So hopefully that is something. But yeah, it could be confusing. And I, I often, I'll see him use a term, and I think he means one thing, but then I'll find a different definition. So it's, it's you, you got to look, if you can find like a Swedenborg search engine, you can search that term and see all the places he, um, all the places that he uses that, and then you can from that start to get a clearer picture of what exactly is he meaning. And if you really want to get into it, look at the Latin, because that that kind of gets you past the different translations, so you know where's all the places this occurs. So anybody who really wants to study hard and, and get an A on the Swedenborg exam. All right, next one. This is from Carlos. Emmanuel Swedenborg says we are to turn away from sin as if on our own, but believe it comes from the Lord. Are we to believe that we turn away from evil using the power of God is giving us or that God causes us to turn? I would, it's, that's not something I've thought about directly before, but looking at it here, I would say option number two, because the way Swedenborg describes it, everything we have we're sort of renting. Even our ability, even our ability to think rationally, this is God's, but it's in us. That God is continually giving it to us and is wanting us to feel like it's our own, because we are life receivers from God. So when you're looking back, you would say, in the moment, you're just supposed to live like it's yours, which is sort of a strange concept, but it's in this way that you experience what God experiences, which is living from yourself, and that's how you form a partnership with God. And we've done some shows about that. But when you're looking back, you say that it was God who did it, and God who wanted to do it. That Swedenborg says that if we were just left to our own devices without God, we would never resist the allure of evil, because it's just, it's too fun. We would never be able to to pull back from it. So in looking back, we not only say, oh, God gave me the power to do it, but God was the one who wanted me to want to resist this in the first place, because God is actually cares about our future happiness, because evil is sort of, you know, getting current happiness at the destruction of your future happiness, just like if you destroy your body with, with various things that are fun. Um, so in the end, I, I, I would say number two, but how, how would I know? I'm just a dude. Okay, all right, uh, so that 
was our questions. Do we have any more? Okay, let's do another one then. This is from Kwame. What is the spiritual symbolism of south and east? So east is, if I remember correctly, east is the most heavenly of the directions, because there you have the rising of the sun, and the um, that symbolizes the beginning of intelligence and wisdom. And the south is because on earth you move south, it gets warmer, so that is moving more into love. The east is moving more into light, and south is moving more into love, because west is the absence of light, and north is the absence of love. That's how I think it plays out. Now, I know we did... Do you guys remember, what was that one we had a map uh, moving around? We, we've done this in an episode before. I don't remember. If, if, uh, if we think of it, I'll post it in the comment. But those are, I believe, and I'm, I'm 91% sure that that's the truth about this. All right, let's do two more questions. Julie, if what we see around us is a correspondence to spiritual things, what do cars zooming around suggest, especially if I don't drive but ride a bicycle and walk? It's all a guess since Swedenborg doesn't comment on cars, but chariots or horses, that kind of thing, represents the human intellect or the power of understanding. So if transportation has to do with that, you would think cars in a dangerous sense, if you're trying to walk and you're worried about, is the, isn't that a picture of how we think about the world? A, a, like a self-centered, I don't care what anyone else is doing, I'm going to go this way, I don't care if what I'm doing is dangerous for people, I'm just going to zoom over here, and it's going to be loud and noisy and polluting, but I just want to go where I want to go, and I don't want anything in my way. That would be sort of a negative correspondences of cars being a representation of sort of the mindset we find ourselves in. There would be a positive correspondence as well, but there's my guess. So I hope you like it. Let's take a look. This is our last one. French Fry, did Swedenborg always go to the world of spirits, or did spirits come to him as well? Both. It was definitely both. That he would have these sort of sojourns into it, as he was talking about here, where he was in the environments and with the spirits, but um, he would also just be, he describes, you know, writing and the spirits commenting on what he's writing. He would, he even talked about walking through town somewhere and the spirits would see certain articles of clothing, because with him, which he said isn't usual, the spirits, because of his opening to the spiritual world, they could see what he saw, and they wanted specific items. They'd, go get that. Go do that. So there was certainly, he was just immersed in it in all forms of it, traveling, uh, having them come to him. He even lists the different kinds of ways he interacts with it at one point in his journal. So there's the answer to that. You guys have been awesome. This has been a lot of fun for me. Appreciate it. Next week, we're going to look at spiritual fermentation which is probably not something anybody's thought about, but this is going to be an in-depth correspondence where we look at how the process, the chemical process of fermentation, actually is a picture of our process of regeneration or spiritual growth and rebirth in this world. And the closer we look at that process, the more we can learn about us and how we should grow. So hopefully that sounds fun. Hope to see you there. See you then.